Hi, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the media. Welcome once again to another PVP press conference. With me is executive committee member of our party and former president, Comrade Barak Jagde, who will be making an opening statement, after which we will be taking questions. Comrade Barak. Over the past several days, as we have been campaigning across the country, a number of people have come up to me and asked me, why is it that the AFC still continues to campaign in their villages as the AFC? And I said to them, I've been saying to them, that it is a deliberate strategy of the AFC um, because Nagamutu has promised to deliver a sizable quantity of Indian votes. So obviously their game plan is that APNU will campaign predominantly in its strongholds, the afro guyanese villages, and that AFC will seek to repeat what it did in 2011. That is to, to take some votes um, away from the PPP in the PPP strongholds. And that is just an electoral ploy. And I, have, I had to explain then, and I wish once again, to talk to the people who were looking at this television program, um, that the AFC is dead now for electoral purposes for the 2015 elections. There is absolutely no AFC. They exist on paper only. That from nomination day, when a single list of candidates was, was submitted to GCOM and they from that day onwards, the AFC ceased to exist as the AFC as we knew in the past. That when you vote, or if you vote for AFC because of their name on the ballot paper, effectively what you're voting for is to make Granger president of Guyana. The president of Guyana under our constitution has total executive power. He's head of state, or the person is head of state, as well as head of government. The prime minister is appointed by the president. We've had a history of sticking with Prime Minister Samuel Hines. We, we believe in our bond. But the president has all the powers. And so, if on day two, Granger decides to fire Nagamoto, he has absolutely no recourse whatsoever. He cannot take their so-called 12 members of parliament and walk out of parliament, as he said they would do, because there would be no 12 AFC members of parliament. And if they even disagree on some issue and Nagamoto were to vote differently in the parliament from, say, APNU, then Nagamoto can be recalled because under our recall legislation, it says that you can, cannot vote against your party. And so they have absolutely no leverage, zero leverage, as they had in 2011. Because they were separate, they could have made deals with APNU or the other side. Now they're subsumed. Granger will decide everything. They are baggage to APNU. They're peripheral to, to APNU's main trust. So, when they come into the villages, they only come there basically with a little yellow flag to fool people. They no longer exist for the 2015 election purposes. You vote for, for them, as they say, vote for us, 
you're effectively voting to give Granger all the power and to be president of Ghana. So I thought I'd deal with that issue first of all. The second thing that bothers me a lot, that over the past weeks, we have seen an increasing rhetoric against, uh, uh, um, from the opposition, particularly Mr. Granger, um, that has no basis in fact and, and is far from the truth. They just turn off, turn off. The so, Mr. Granger has been saying things that make that would cause one to wonder if he is in his full senses. He goes to, we've already had to deal with this unbelievable declaration that elections in the past were not rigged, contrary to what every single Guyanese knows, what every single international um, body knows. He has made that declaration, and he has gotten away with it. But he compounds this by going to their meeting at Golden Grove, and, say, and, and he, says, he said there that from 20, oh, um, 1992 to now, all the elections have been rigged. So what he is effectively saying is that not only did we rig the elections, but that the Carter Center, the Organization of American State, States, the European Union, the CARICOM, the uh, Commonwealth, they have all conspired with the PPP, all these international observers, to declare every single one of these elections free and fair from 1992. That is what he is saying. Now, I can't conclude that Mr. Granger is losing his senses. I can only conclude, because I would not want to disparage the gentleman, I can only conclude that he is preparing his supporters for what he sees as an inevitable defeat at the polls on May 11th. And he is already <clears throat> question the list itself. They're now saying that we have thousands of Venezuelans in the interior who are voting, will vote for us, and Brazilians and Chinese. They're saying that we are buying ID cards. All of these things are to hype up their, their support base so that when they lose the elections, they can say, as they have done in every election in the past, contrary to the observer's reports and to everyone who has observed, uh, witnessed those elections, that they were cheated. And so we see this as desperation on the part of Mr. Granger. He's getting desperate. And the desperation is further compounded by the acts of thuggery and hooliganism that we see from some of their supporters. We have seen the GAPA issue a statement that they have organized groups of people with APNU t-shirts going to the markets and saying to people, um, after May 11th, you can't sell in the city anymore. The farmers were at the, around the market squares. And we've seen the pulling down of our posters. And just last night, um, Hours after, hours after the record, you know, the, the code of conduct was signed by all of the parties condemning violence, committing themselves not to use violence. They had a bunch of thugs 
stoning our meeting in Warlock, where Dr. Luncheon was speaking. This was hours after the signing of the Code of Conduct. And you had senior members of the APNU coalition there. You can see it in the video. Maybe we'll play it a little bit later for everyone, everyone to see. Um, but we can put, take off the video now because I would like the country to see how organized the tuggery is. Why do you have to come to our meetings and stone pe people who speak at our meetings? It's only an act of desperation that would cause you to do this. And then this is minutes after, hours after you've signed the code of conduct. And so we have to condemn this in the strongest terms and we hope that GCOM is paying attention to it and the international observers are too. I have <clears throat> noticed that in the last several weeks too, the attack on personalities has mounted that the opposition keeps, seems to think that if it goes after individuals, that it will win the elections. And I, again, I wondered why. And then my conclusion is that they cannot deal with the issues, the issues of their track record, the issue about their most recent positions in parliament, contradictory positions, anti-national positions, <clears throat> and their lack of vision for the future. So if you can't deal with the issues about what you will do to make people's lives better in this country, the best way to, monk, to, to pursue your campaign and to propagate it is to go after individuals. But even on the individual issues, <clears throat> we have seen particularly two media houses, but one more than the other, the Kaicho News, has been fabricating a ton of things um, to help them along. For example, they're running a Jack Dale legacy ad, and they said that we spent $32 million on the Brazil fiber optic cable. It is, I mentioned that at the last meeting, that it is not true. That the state expended $4.5 million on the fiber optic cable to Brazil. It should have had stronger supervision. The contractors did not lay the cable well. So there is a problem with the cable, but not 4.32 um, million, no 32 million was spent on it. And this, in fact, the implementation of the project took place even after I had left office. I see they're mentioning the specialty hospital that it was awarded to a company in 2012. And this is part of the Jack Dale legacy. Well, I left office in 2011. And, but let's talk about that, the award of that project. That Ramjatan and the others supported it. There were funds for it. When the bid came out and Ramjatan client lost the bid, it came second. And he tried to get the government to reverse the award. The government did not. It stuck with the tender process. Ramjatan then went to parliament and influenced cutting the budget. So effectively what he was using, he was using public funds to pursue a private agenda. I've argued that this has been an open case of conflict of interest and tantamount to corruption. As I've argued that Badal was his client when they tried to block the Marriott because the only beneficiary of blocking the Marriott would have been Badal because he has a, com 
a, a hotel, the Pegasus, and he was worried that he would lose business if Marriott came on stream. And Ramjatan again was a uh, part of the, the conflict of interest. And I see in that legacy they mention Amila. And Amila, the only people who benefited because the FIP Motilal contract, we had five bids, and FIP Motilal had the lowest of any of the tenders, any of the tenders there when it was awarded. And the, on the other project, guess who were the, the beneficiaries? Cathy Hughes was the PRO for Site Global, and Nigel Hughes was the company secretary for the company pursuing the hydropower. If anyone made money, they did. And so we have not gone. The contract for the hydro has not even been awarded. But that is supposed to be a Jagdeo legacy of corruption. And then about my Jagdeo destroyed accountability. Well, we had in my tenure a new procurement law passed. The program budgeting started, the IFMAS implemented. We've had the, the constitution changed so that the Auditor General could report directly to the National Assembly. In the PPP civic tenure, we are um, part of, we started submitting our reports to the Integrity Commission as ministers, as the president. I did when I was there. The only people who have refused to submit their statements of income and assets to the Integrity Commission have been some of the opposition leaders. And maybe we should ask Ramjatan and a few others whether they have submitted their statement of income and assets to the Integrity Commission. And if they're so transparent, would Ramjatan, Cathy Hughes, Nigel Hughes, and Trotman make public their declaration to the GR, GRA, you will see if you a shocking story. I know from the past when I was president that some, when they did a broad category of lawyers who were paying taxes, that the maximum tax being paid at that time was a few million dollars. But if they're seeking public office, maybe we should start by and they are so clean and value accountability so much, why don't they just make public their declarations to GRA? Let the country decide how clean, and including Nagamotu, how clean they have been about reporting their income and their assets. And maybe the media should ask them to do that. If you're so so, so concerned about accountability, why don't you start by doing it before the elections? You want to bet not a single one of them will do it. I'm tell, wagering today, not a single one of them. So all of these legacy issues that they have in the Kaicho news, I've suddenly become a close friend of Roger Khan. Well, I've never met Roger Khan, but you ask Nagamutu or, or Ramjatan if they met with with um, Roger Khan and I asked Glenn Lal if he used to meet with Roger Khan. I never did. And I was never part of any phantom squad to kill, kill anyone. But suddenly I've become Roger Khan's friend in their ad. This is it. If you ask them how much money they receive for blocking the money laundering bill, when the American government, the Canadian government, the British government urged the PNC to support the money anti-money laundering bill. When the people from CFATF came here and met with them and urged them to pass it, the international community urged them and they blocked it. And who are the beneficiaries? The only people who can be the beneficiaries will be the drug dealers and the money launderers. So, they have, and maybe a lot of the flags that they're purchasing now and the paraphernalia, because they have tons of resources to do that, maybe some of that came from those sources. In fact, people are very suspicious in this country. 
and they told me the man who was killed at Agricola, that the man was willing to make a statement about where the money went. And, but I don't know if it's true, the truth, because I just met a man this morning on the street and said he was prepared to say that he gave a lot of money to the opposition to buy their paraphernalia and flags, etc. And I don't know if it's the truth, but maybe since we're in the, in the period where rumors could be elevated into facts, as Kaicho News does every day, and they can go on the platform and repeat those rumors, maybe it's time that we also start exploring some of these things. Because they do it every single day. And you're going to see the big outcry in Hullabaloo, as I always say, the big outcry about that statement. But they expect to, to uh, elevate rumors every single day about every single member of our side and that we stay quiet while we believe that a lot of this is done to hide their own record. We have, they have hidden Greenwich. I don't see him appearing anymore because they believe he's a liability given his record and that he will again be the Minister of Finance. They have hidden away the issue where he transferred a house in a prime area in the country to himself long after he became, um, he demitted the office of Minister of Finance, although the house was transferred, transported in his name as Minister of Finance. Granger Grange, Grange himself, I noticed since my last press conference that Granger and the, the military bigwigs with him have not said a single word about, about their record. And so I say to the soldiers and policemen again, they can't love you today. They can't love the veterans today. And when Greenwich was there, Minister of Finance, and Granger was the National Security Advisor, the budget for the Army, uh, capital budget, was 300,000 Ghana dollars in 1990, $625,000 in 1991, and seven million in 1992. We have pointed out that this is one private today it's so unbelievable, a single private salary today. One soldier in the army earns more than the entire capital budget of the army in 1990. They haven't come back. They can't say it's not true. That the um, dairy best pension today is probably 10 times that of the entire capital budget of the army in 1990 his pension today. And so that is your record. Why don't you answer the record? Why don't you say they're busy to make statements about everything? They're prone to make statements. Tell the soldiers why. Tell the soldiers why. You didn't do something when you had the power, but suddenly now you love the soldiers. They haven't said a word about it. I can point by contrast that my, our record, the last five years alone, the capital budget of the Army was over $2.5 billion. You do the maths and, and, and figure it out. Not a word about that. And so we, these are the real issues. And they try to hide a lot from them. So I want to... <coughs> I just managed, 15 minutes before I came, I got a copy of their manifesto that they're going to launch today, App News Manifesto. And you know the, the fiasco surrounding them leaking their manifesto. And then after we pointed out the contradictions in their manifesto, after we pointed out that almost 75% of the policies outlined in their manifesto 
was lifted from various documents that the PPP has already produced and published after we pointed out that some of their policies basically not or just not contradictory but will bankrupt the Treasury and the country they withdrew their manifesto they made some changes I noticed that they made some changes but they still have not addressed the fundamental issue that for you to to spend money you also have to create revenue streams you can't you have to create wealth before you expend it if you do not identify sources of creation new sources sources and new sources of the creation of national wealth and you keep spending more you're taking the country back to a period where we had all the difficulties the 80s because you will have to find a way of financing the expenditure and the only way you can do it is by debt and if you accumulate more debt you're taking our country backwards so I looked to find the new sources of growth that are part of a consistent framework because you can pluck things from PPP uh, or from various documents but you also have to have a framework a vision because all of these policies have to gel together their manifesto doesn't have any of that the new one the new version I look through and I'm just going to be random in my comments because I've not read it carefully as yet I've just scanned to see the sources of the growth and did none of those but it is so I, I not just contradictory but they believe we have short memories so take for example Amerindian development and I'm very happy that they chose this picture to put in their manifesto isn't this a wonderful picture with these bright young Amerindian faces look at these kids lining up with school uniform and in a spanking new school behind them and it's taken from now one of the communities I'm not sure which community but it is a testimony to what has happened under the PPP Civic from the days when there, were no there was no secondary education in the Amerindian communities, from the days when they had no scholarship, etc., we are very proud that we built secondary schools in, in so many areas, like four areas in Region 9 and, and in Region 7 and Region 1, and now we have tons of kids at the President's College and the Teachers Training College and many Amerindians now in the police force, etc., and, and over 30 odd doctors who came back from abroad, now young Amerindian doctors. We're proud of this legacy. We're pleased that they put this here. But what they promise is to establish a hinterland and depressed areas fund for the Amerindians. Isn't this an insult to people after they cut? 4.5 billion dollars from the Amerindian Development Fund and from the Community Development Plan. This money that we got through the Norwegian Agreement was supposed to go to fund the village development plans that each of those villages had come up with by themselves. And the villages had said, we're going to approach our development from two perspectives. We want to make sh ensure food security for the village. And two, we want to ensure that we have a, a, an activity in the village or a few activities that will generate employment for people. They cut that money from the budget. And now they're promising 
to create a fund. We already have an Amerindian Development Fund. We have a huge program for community, um, the, the community development plan. Billions of dollars running into it. We have set aside a large sum of money to settle the Amerindian land issues. We are now putting in not just individual solar panels in each home, but we are putting in large-scale solar panels in each of these villages so that we can uh, computerize every one of them. And now all you promise here is establishment of a hinterland fund. It is an insult to, to Amerindian people. Insult, and that is what I'm talking about when I talk about their man, man, manifesto. They, they spoke about housing. Look at housing. One tiny section on housing. And the biggest initiative that they're promising on the housing is a house rental initiative. House rental initiative. In this day and age, when our aim is to ensure that every Ghanaian young professional own their own home, they're promising, their biggest promise is a house rental initiative. It is shameful, absolutely shameful. They believe that people should be, you know, should go and live in rent, <laughs> rented homes. We believe otherwise. We believe people should own things. It's this old philosophy, the PNC philosophy, that you don't create wealth. You don't create personal wealth or individual wealth. People should not accumulate things. Spend every cent of it on rental. Old philosophy. That is their, their policy. Under youth development, they say, establish a national youth council. Now, as far as my memory serves me well, there is already a national youth council promising things that, they are, that are already there. Develop and implement a plan for universalizing a program of technical and vocational tra training. Now, the last time I understand this is that we built we now upgraded the technical program in, in Linden, Technical Institute. We put one in Essequibo, where we have established where one in West Demerara, in Region 5. We have in Region 6. So we are already doing this. But we have also promised two various programs not to take kids and send them in the interior to march, but at least 8,000 youngsters will be trained in tech voc education, people, school dropouts, etc., that are not even part of the formal tech voc training system. And we went even further. We're not going to universalize tech voc training. We want to universalize ed university level training, that is, tertiary education through an online program that will reach Linden, Essequibo, Burbies, any part of this country, so that people can do a degree without even attending the physical campus. That is what we are working on, a big vision. So, so some of these things, they promise a lot of investigations investigations into everything under the sun, the specialty hospital, the airport, Marriott, etc. Their whole tenure will be about investigations. But, but I saw something, then the infrastructure. Isn't it amazing that they are promising now to build the Brazil road, to do the Brazil road, to construct a deep water harbor, to do the hydro, to do national airstrips, etc. Isn't it? Doesn't this look very familiar to you? I can I can show you that it's lifted. The entire section on infrastructure is almost lifted from some even word for word from some of the things that we proposed. And then I come to the end. Just 
because I'm not doing this in any special order. I think it's a it manifesto, as I said before, lacks imagination. It's uh, some v vague promises and some specific promises that are not connected to a strategy. It, it does not offer how we are going to finance these, these promises, and that can only lead to failure. So I've seen Mr. Granger saying a couple of things. I noticed on Demerar Wave, he said that we are emptying the Treasury that he said we are emptying the Treasury because there is no budget and for the year. And therefore, we are opening up all these big projects. So it must be that the government is spending money on them. But what are the big projects he's talking about? He's talking about a track that is already been built for a while. Talking probably about qual fund, private investment some Texilla, a private investment again, the Marriott, which had already been in stream. But he said something that makes me believe that clearly he does not understand the economics of the country. He says that we are this is exactly what he said, a lot of public revenue has been diverted from the contingency fund into GGMC, Forestry Commission, NISL, and elsewhere. If Granger can prove that there is a cent, one cent, that is diverted from the contingency fund into GGMC, Forestry Commission, or any other place diverted from the contingency fund that was in the contingency fund and put there, I stopped campaigning today. I stopped campaigning and maybe their dream will come true if he could prove that. It's an absolute falsehood. Absolute falsehood. He doesn't understand that there is a 112 provision that allows you to spend one twelfth of the previous year's expenditure if there is no budget and it runs up to the time the new budget is passed. Now clearly we are not going to have a new budget passed in the, by April 30th. So that one twelfth provision on the recurrent side alone will be used. Ashni Singh, I just spoke with Ashni Singh and I said have you released any other funds outside of the 112 provision? And he said yes, for two places, for GCOM and for the police because they have to go in line, the, the security forces. Not a cent outside of the 112 provision, although he is empowered by not the, the financial laws, but by the constitution. If the constitution says, once elections are announced by the president, the Minister of Finance can meet any expenditure. But he has been very, he is stuck with that old, the old provision, although he can authorize money elsewhere. So now money is being spent outside of that. And on the capital projects, there is a simple provision. You can't approve new projects if there is no appropriation. So what happens is that, but if projects were approved last year, they continue to be funded on a rollover way. It's simple. But if you do not understand this, then that brings me to their last page, which says how they're going to finance the budget and, and their promises. They, they know that this will be an issue. So they said they will be reaping the democratic dividend as though Guyana is not a democratic country. So guess what will happen? That they will reduce capital flight um, by 200 million US dollars. You ask them how they come up with 200 million dollars. It, it is a figment of Granger's imagination. 
And if it's Grenages, it's worse because he has no imagination whatsoever. It is a figment of their imagination. Secondly, they said they would augment capital inflows um, by 15%. By this augmentation is projected to be 15%. So more money will flow in. So they want to chase away the Chinese already. They want to chase away the Russians, the Brazilians, the Indians, everybody. But they will augment capital flows by 15%. I don't see how augmenting capital flow or reducing capital um, flight will result in more revenue because you pay these expenditure from revenue, not from an improved balance of payment position. These will only serve to improve the balance of payment of the country, not necessarily to increase revenue, unless they propose to increase taxes. They will be reducing incentives for the underground economy. Well, I don't know how you're reducing incentives to the underground economy. Um, but, but let's give them something because they know maybe their friends, the same people I mentioned who wouldn't in the money laundering side, maybe, maybe volunteer to pay a bit more taxes. Um, the growth of GDP to reach its potential. Now, you're chasing away investors already and the GDP will grow by an additional three percentage point. It's all nonsense. It's all nonsense. If you're, so that, all right, the country grows a bit more. One assumes the tax base would broaden. But had, had they not cut the budget by $80 billion in the last three years, the country probably would have been growing by 8% more. Had they not cut the budget in the last few years. And, uh, Something about we're siphoning off 1% of Petro-Caribbean money. Pure nonsense. Pure nonsense. This is what they, they said they will do to finance the budget deficit, um, not to finance their promises. Now, clearly, I saw them saying earlier, again, on them or our waves, they would use money that we already have to pay the, these things. But let me make it clear. In the last three years, we have run a fiscal deficit on average about 5% of GDP. It means that our expenditure are greater than our revenue by 5 percentage point of GDP. It was 25% of GDP, the, the deficit was in, in the past. One quarter of the size of our economy when we got into office, it's now 5% of GDP. So when we have this deficit of 5% of GDP, we have to either borrow from abroad, because we don't borrow much from the ba local banking system, or we get grants. So it's through loans and grants to finance that deficit. So there is no money automatically in the treasury just like that to finance because we still have to finance a deficit. They're confusing the money that we have in the central bank in reserves, but there is a cost to spending the money. There's a cost, and if the country runs out of reserves, you know what will happen. The exchange rate would collapse, inflation would skyrocket, or balance of payment will go out of whack, and what's the only tool that you use to fight all of this? Like in the past, when the exchange rate was, was collapsing, they had to push interest rates to 35, 37, 40 percent under the PNC, just to prevent the exchange rate from collapsing further, because in a single year it collapsed by a, maybe 800 percent. It is old philosophy. So this manifesto, it is just policies taken randomly from PPP civic documents. I, we can give you the documents. has no strategic framework. 
does not identify the real sources of growth, how growth will come and revenue will come, how it will expand the economy, what the policy prescriptions are for unlocking growth in those sectors. It does not speak about if a, a good use of the resources. It is definitely, it will not have, you not have macroeconomic stability, you'd have monetary chaos as well as fiscal chaos in this country if we pursue this hodgepodge of promises. It's all empty promises that they're making. They have taken every person's concerns in the country as they walk around and try to put them in here. So with the hope, like they promised the sugar workers 20% increase in wages when in the last election, and then three months, four months later in parliament, when we said we want to help the sugar industry cut, cut the budget, the sugar budget. This manifesto is at best a wa waste of time. So we are prepared, let me make it clear, we are prepared to talk about the issues. You saw our manifesto, we are willing to debate the issues anytime, our manifesto issues. Our president is still waiting for Granger, he's hiding from the debate. Our president is still waiting for him. Um, we are prepared to defend our track record. We're prepared to, to defend our, the vision for Guyana um, at any point in time. And we are prepared to take them on on the issues that they talk about legacy. This is not about Jack Dale. Jack Dale is not running. They're still stuck in that timeline. This is about the future of the people of this country. Jack Dale is now running to be president. There's Ramatar and Elizabeth Harper and a PBP civic team. And we have, we have a good track record and we have a clear plan for the future. It's not about Jack Dale. And, but I am prepared to take them on on my legacy any day. And no matter, no amount of distortion by Kaichou News on a daily basis will either deter me from campaigning, nor would it cow me so that I will fold up and, and go away and, and serve their purpose. It's not going to happen. They tried every one of those lies they have repeated in the last three years. Nothing new about how I own um, airlines and all kinds of things. And the people, I see they say it about the spectrum, the frequency and I give my friends and family. Well, there were four, four afro Guyanese and the people, maybe a Portuguese, right? Five of the, the nine licenses that were issued were given to people, non-Indians too. I don't see them mentioning those names. Five of the nine li radio licenses. The, well, they are my family too. They're part of the Guyanese family, those people. So, I have, I can defend my record, but it's not about my record. It is about what they have to offer versus what we have to offer. And I say we have far superior product. Thank you. Thanks. You had a long statement, right? <laughs> Got my call. I knew. Young Guyana um, Mr. Jadio, could you say whether or not you are concerned about the tone that these events that are taking place, like those at Warlock and other parts of the country are setting for elections day, obviously given the history of this country. And could you say who were the senior members of the coalition that you said may have been spotted or present within the, um, the audience here at Warlock? Well, from my report, let me make it clear. At least one person, Aubrey, Aubrey Norton, mm -hmm. he was there. Yeah. And, he, and he was there when I was stoned in Warlock to me and Luncheon years ago. Okay. So they haven't changed. Mm -hmm. We went there to Warlock to speak years ago, and uh, it was the same behavior. And those who say, don't look at the past, don't look to the past, well, we don't need to go to the past to see PNC behavior. We're seeing the manifestation of it again. They have not changed. So though they, because I saw them using Obama. And, and I must say that it is an insult to Obama and the American ambassador should object to them using Obama in their ad. Granger is no Obama. Obama never 
was in any army when their, their professionalism was subverted, when they were forced to fetch ballot boxes, and when they were forced to give guns to the PNC, or, or when they were part of a plot to kill a patriot, Walter Rodney. Granger was there. He helped to subvert the professionalism. Obama, Obama never was part of any of those things. So, so they should, we should object to that. What's the, the tone and I, I'm, I'm very concerned about the tone. As I said before, I think it's an, a sign of desperation that they, they thought we were flat-footed, they thought they had an easy victory, and then they saw the crowds, they know that we're working on the ground, they know that suddenly all that, that green, the Ramjatan and, and Nagamutu, they're going into the areas where they had crowds in the past, and suddenly they're not getting anybody anymore. I heard they went into Windsor Forest last night, I was in Windsor Forest, and we had, guy said to me, the biggest crowd ever, even in 92. And the last elections, I heard, they had a bigger crowd than we had in Windsor Forest, AFC. They got four persons that, that when they went there recently. So what they, the promise of delivering all of this support has suddenly been evaporating rapidly. And they're doing, they're, they understand it internally. And so they're becoming more desperate. And as they become more desperate, the country needs to get to, to be more cautious. And the international observers and GCOM. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for it? Uh, one, one, one minute. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Sir, I want to take you back to the statement you made about the adversity that you did. Sure. Now, you said you were informed of such by someone from off the street. Could you say if that person provided direct evidence more than hearsay? No, uh, I know you're going to want to say provide evidence. That's why I said that I don't want to de elevate rumors to facts. I said I don't know if it's the truth. I said to you, someone told me off the street. But every single day, this is what they do. They elevate rumors to facts, they publish them in the newspapers. If we were to play tit for tat, then I would say, I know this is to be true. I don't know it to be true. So I, that is why I'm saying that I was told by someone because there are suspicions of people out there. I don't want to, I don't want to do that, elevate rumors to facts. And I don't know whether it's true or not. But I can, t I can tell you the APNU has said that we brought in thousands of Venezuelans in the interior to vote. And they say this on their platform. That's a rumor that we are buying ID cards. That's a rumor. If we, if we do the same thing, like I, I just said here, then, then where do you draw the line? And people should fact check, check these things. The media should rather than, rather than take sides, fact check people's stuff. I, I came here and I showed you a section of the budget. I showed you a section of the budget on their record that Greenwich put. Why not fact check, fact check that and ask Granger? Let him come up with an alternative explanation. If he can, then it says a lot about his record. The campaign needs to move into more factual issues. Unfortunately, no one is held account for the facts. And so if I, if I am misleading it with the facts too, then I should be called up and exposed. But I did not say I know it to be true, nor did I say I have evidence. I just told you what I heard. And, and we can simply raise it anywhere. Yes, please. Mr. Janio, um, could you say uh, whether it would be under your tenure as president uh, that you would instruct that the military criminal, uh, the military, <coughs> the military intelligence unit of the army be shut down? And secondly, um, why under your administration uh, there was a deafening silence about Roger Kent's repeated advertisement and paid into newspapers about him 
having played a major role in averting a coup? I, first thing, I don't know about Roger Khan averting any coup in this country because I don't think there was a plot to overthrow the, um, the country, the, the government, from our security forces. There may be a, there may be a, been a, a plot by those in Buxton and their intellectual authors to create a situation in the country that made it ungovernable as they had promised so often before. But the security forces, I can arrest, I know for sure, were never engaged in any plot to overthrow the government or no coup. And once the security forces are not part of any, any plot, I know our security forces can take on anyone. They're well trained, they can take on anyone who seeks to subvert our constitution and the government of the day. I'm confident about that. So I, I know I don't pay too much attention to people's ads, etc. That's one. But Roger Khan was never my friend. In fact, he was friendlier from my, the intelligence report with some of the names I mentioned before. I was very friendly with them from the intelligence report. And there are many times, there are many, many issues that came up at Defense Board about various aspects of performance. I remember one colonel came to me and said to me, the report you're getting from the military intelligence has to go through one character and it gets sterilized before it comes to you. And he shared with me the initial report, the one that was drafted by the soldiers who were actually going out. They were picking up different things. But when it went through the process of on the chain up to the commander in chief, key things were taken out of them, particularly things that identified political operatives or questionable, a question their role in the incidents at Buxton. So I had grave concerns about the official channel, sometimes the veracity of their reports. But they did not know that I had parallel to that the initial drafts that came from a lot of other soldiers. So did I have concerns about military intelligence? Yes, I, I, I had concerns about the reports and the veracity of those reports. But did I shut it down because they were going after Leslie Ramsamy or something like that? That's what I saw some unnamed source from the military said. Absolutely false. Absolutely false. But you did shut it down. No, I don't think I shut it down. I think we had changes. The G, G2 still operated, but you had significant changes in, in G2. G2 never been shut down. You can't shut down Army intelligence. I think they had some changes to Army intelligence. Dr. Luncheon dealt much more on an operation because as Commander-in-Chief, he's Secretary to Defense Board, so he will get deal more on an operational level if they came in to deal with those issues. But I know what took place, my concerns about the reports that came to me, because they were sterilized by some individuals. And that is why I said, in retrospect, now knowing what I know today, maybe a lot of the events that took place at that time, I can cast a new picture, have a new interpretation of that period. I wasn't, to, I wasn't naive. I was naive. I knew, too, that you had people who were interested in us not doing what we should have done, which is to get rid of those criminals very early, to liberate the community, the Bux Buxton, and the people of Buxton, liberate them early. You had people who were working from the inside 
to undermine that process. You know, you yourself know that from the time sometimes the soldiers leave the barracks to do a morning raid already in Buxton, our informants in Buxton were saying the people have moved to the back already. They know, they get a call. A lot of things happen in that era. I hope that is why I said that these former heads of the army and police, that we don't have to someday talk about all that we know. Because if I, I, I there are things that a government and there are things that there is a relationship between commander in chief and chief of staff. But I know I never gave a single illegal instruction ever in my tenure. Anything that is contrary to the Defense Act, the Constitution, or not, nor have I asked anyone to deny any citizen of this country their, their, any of their rights, including to f set up these squads, whatever they say, these death squads or whatever, that kill 500 and 800 people, etc. You saw that in, in the ad. Yeah, yeah, yes, go can on. I, can I follow? Would it say that there were people who were working on the inside to undermine some of the processes? Yeah. But did you not, not approve, but did you turn a blind eye to unconventional means the of some of these criminals? No. No, we didn't. There was, there was what I thought. There, there was no... I didn't think the criminals were helping us. At one time, they got into a conflict with the group out of Buxton. I think this came after that group kidnapped one of their own. And that's where the war between these two parties started. And let me tell you what I said to everyone, including the donors and everyone. When a single soldier or policeman loses his or her life because they killed a lot of them, I worry. When ordinary people lose their lives, I worry a lot because the soldiers, their mothers and sisters and fathers would come to see me. I have to see all of them. But I said, if these criminals kill each other, I, lose, I don't lose any sleep at night. That's what I said. Because they were just brut brutal. A lot of them were killing ordinary people. So that was my approach to it. But uh, I never turned a blind eye to anything. Because we went after all the criminals in the country. So I don't, I don't have a problem. And, and you can understand, maybe today, given what has happened with particularly with Mr. Collins and Felix, how difficult it was to be Commander-in-Chief. And now today, in retrospect, think that maybe the, every time we gave an instruction, a lawful instruction, it was never carried out professionally. That is what uh, the question that we should ask. That when the lawful instructions were given, and they were all lawful, when the defense board <coughs> says that we should do something, whether they were actually carried out professionally. And had they been carried out professionally, whether the country can, uh, would have been spared the trauma that we went through. So many people losing their lives, including soldiers and policemen, and, and so much confusion, loss of property, etc. Yes? Any other questions? Yes, please. Two more questions, right? Because the um, former president has <coughs> sought another engagement yeah. against them. Mm -hmm. <coughs> You denied that US $30 million was spent on the cable, right? Can you explain then how the cost of maintenance of the uh, cable exceeds the price that was spent 
Federal Enforcement, and two, can you give like a breakdown of what were the components that needed to be killed? Okay, let me let me make it clear. The contract was awarded to several Guyanese companies to lay the cable before I left office. I, this project continued. I gather this is all I'm speaking now from being outside of the government because that was my last engagement that a contract was awarded when I was there to several Guyanese companies to lay the cable. The cable was supposed to bring cheaper bandwidth in to our country for the e-governance project and for our rollout of free Wi-Fi to the public across Guyana with bandwidths up to maybe 250K so that we could, people who would have gotten free laptops would be able to connect to the internet. That was the purpose of the cable. Because the cost of bandwidth would have been just over $500 per meg on this cable when the cost of it at that time was over $2,000 per meg from GTNT. Okay, that was the purpose of the project. So cheaper bandwidth means we could have supplied more people. From what I gathered, that the, the cut cable in some sections were not laid properly, in some sections. That it was not laid deep enough and so when the rains, and you had difficult terrain, rock, rocky surfaces, etc. So when the rains came, apparently these cables were exp came out and they were damaged. And that repairing the cable, so that the government needed to spend some money on repairing the cable. From what I gather again, this is all information that's coming to me, that there was a proposal to fix this cable but that the people would do some things in addition to that. They would probably put, maybe bury the cables in conduits, which might be different, cost more. So that rather than bury the cable directly, they will bury it in conduits, etc., so that then you, you can avoid that kind of reoccurrence in the future. So from that perspective, the cost may be higher now because how they lay the cable will be different. Now, is there a monopoly now on this cable? That's not true. This cable, we need 30 cables. I thought that everyone would celebrate anybody who wants to bring in a cable. So GTNT brought in a cable, but they're the only supplier of fiber optic bandwidth now to Guyana, GTNT. So Digicel applied and we gave Digicel permission. Um, that is some, I don't, I don't know exactly when, but it should be recently, Digicel got permission. With this third cable coming in, and I gather it's a joint venture between a local person and someone from Venezuela, that this cable will allow them to pass traffic from northern Brazil through Guyana to North America because there are some concerns by no, in northern Brazil that they only have one route through Venezuela now. So they need, you need redundancy in the system, you know, multiple connections. So if one goes down, it doesn't affect your operation. So that is what I gather. But we don't need only three cables. If we get some countries have 15, 20 cables. The more cables we get, the lower the cost of bandwidth. That, that means then cheaper internet services to our people. We can move to 4G applications quickly. We can then have maybe two megs, uh, the usual on a mobile device. So you can start streaming on your mobile device, videos, a whole range of stuff. It will change the landscape in Guyana. Right now, the cost of bandwidth is too high because we only have a single cable. So you can't get um, enough bandwidth to even stream properly 
if you have Netflix or any other, you're trying, you go on YouTube or some of the other places, much less to get enough bandwidth on the mobile devices, which is what we need for people right across. So everyone who has a phone then could watch a movie comfortably, watch anything on, on their phones, the fourth generation. We need more cables. So this talk about, I saw their ICT section. If we give 10 persons, tomorrow if you want to build a cable, bring in a cable, I am suspect the government will give you permission too, because it's your money. And if you're willing to risk your money and bring it in competitively and sell bandwidth cheaper than GTNT, the country benefits. There's absolutely no monopoly on that. As many cables as we can bring in will be good for the country. So why, why is this big hullabaloo again about this cable? I know that this particular cable had difficulties because it was not laid properly, but it's been fixed and there are others who will bring in cable. So I thought this is good for the country to open up the sector. We want plan to liberalize telecommunication. I see they're promising it, but they're the ones who give a 40 years monopoly on the cable, on, not on cable, on telephone services to GTNT, internet services. And GTNT, over the years, have consistently blocked many of our ICT initiatives. In one, they, they managed to block a loan years ago. This was in the early 2000s that we had before the IDB to roll out internet services cafes across Guyana supported by the government. So, so I thought this was a really good thing. I see them saying, don't give out all of these licenses. This is not a monopoly sector. You want more people to bring in. Okay, but, okay right. I just have one follow-up uh, question. When you say that you've never turned a blind eye to anything, the U.S. League Cables expressed the connection with Roger Khan um, and various members of the government. Wouldn't you have knowledge of that? Well, the U.S. leak cables. I got a visit from the from the um, the ambassador, and he said to me that well, maybe I shouldn't say that. But the U.S. government said they had no comment on these leak cables themselves. But let me tell you why I have to be careful about had to be careful about these leak cables. I explained some time back that the U.S. government at that time came to me and said, after Felix got caught up with this tape and he had to leave, you know, the, the tape that somehow has disappeared. I know they had Nandalal, and maybe rightfully so, um, his tape being played every day, but I noticed the Felix tape, nobody mentions that although he's a key member of APNU. So after he left, I got a visit, and I, I explained this story already to the public, so I'm just repeating what I said, from someone the U.S. Embassy, and he said to me that we would not like you to appoint the crime chief, who was Henry Green, the commissioner of police, because we have some concerns. Um, invest that there was an investigation. So I said to him, hold on a minute. This man has been my crime chief for several years. You had all of these concerns about him. And now, when I'm about to name him commissioner of police, all these years, you didn't say a word to me. If he was doing anything illegal, why now at this hour? So I said, all right. If you can get me the information um, and show that the investigation, what you're saying is true, I, I may concede. He went back, I said, tell me the nature of the investigation, what you're accusing him of, etc. Came back to my office with representatives from a few other foreign powers, British, the Canadian, European Union, and they said to me, he said to me, we still don't want you to appoint him, but I'm not authorized to give you the information. 
uh, know what we know about him. So I said to him, hold on a minute. You're telling me, as president of the country, you would not like me to appoint someone. But you don't want to tell me, you know, you can't give me what he's being accused of. This is my citizen. So I chased him out of my office. I chased him out of my office because I think it was disrespectful. And this is, this is not a colony anymore. This is not a colony. And I wouldn't have allowed myself as president of this country to allow my, my people, my citizens, to be treated that way. So I went ahead and appointed him. The couple of weeks later, uh, when the WikiLeaks came out, I saw some meetings that were supposed to take place that the British High Commissioner said that at that time said he, was, he came to see me three times or two times to talk about the matter. It was a total lie, to absolute false. Because he wanted, I suspect, to tell the Americans that he was trying to convince me. But he made up these meetings. I had resolved at that time, I had resolved at that time, not to take any single action on the basis of leak cable. Because I knew how wrong it was about that. And then when I look further about the frivolous things in the cable. I found also that Mr. Stanley Ming, that we, we had a report that said, a US drug report that said, the government gave some forest concessions to a drug dealer. I don't know, I think it was Roger Khan, same Roger Khan. So we said, this is absolutely untrue. It's not true. We never gave a forest concession to him. So when we spoke with the American government, they said, we can't change it just like that. So I said, hold on a minute. This report is going to be, has been sent around the world, will be in the public domain for years to come. And you're saying, you know differently now that it's not true, change it. And they said they couldn't do that. But when WikiLeaks came out, I saw who carried that information. It was Mr. Stanley Ming, who was part of the PNC reform, who told the ambassador at that time that we had done this. And rather than them checking, because this was a partisan man, a member of the PNC at that time, telling them, they put it in the cable, the cable to Washington. And then it found its way into a report issued by the US government without a single verification. So I, res I had resolved at that time that I could not trust anything in that report. And so that is why I, I didn't. I saw the report talking about people's affairs and all kinds of stuff around the Caribbean. And I wonder, really, is this what people do in your country? So I just gave you two examples. Uh, some of these things sometimes, maybe after these elections are over, I do a sit down and tell it all with, um, about my experiences as president and the battles that we fought. But let me make it clear. I'm not allowing any foreign power. If tomorrow Granger gets into trouble or the worst PNC person, I'll defend him as a Guyanese. I'll defend him against Ghani. If anyone tries to, foreigner tries to snatch away his right. This is my country. I believe in the people of this country. We are two sides of the same family, PNC and PAP, two sides. Uh, it's the same family. We, get the, we have disputes now. But I would not allow people from abroad to come here and run amok among our, our citizens. I never did as president, and I will defend it today today. That is why I stood by Henry Green. If you come and tell me something about our citizen, any one of them, expect us to, you have to, you have to, to substantiate it. Thank you very much. Um, 
Yeah. Maybe some of you can come here it better for me rather than to look over there. If you come across here. Dennis, so I can look down the table. I, I don't want to leave you out. Push for, come over here, please. Yeah, what about?